everyone. Thank you so much and welcome to this session. I know that was a very quick transition from our final plenary session over to this closing session. And so can we join together in one more round of virtual applause and written gratitude in the chat if you are so moved for Shafali, Brandon, Lenya, and Daniel for that incredible session. And I think we can all agree that those four speakers definitely embody what care, collaboration, accountability, responsiveness, and empowerment can look like when it comes to wildfire mitigation and recovery. We're really grateful and inspired. Thank you for those words of gratitude. And it is now 1235 PM Mountain Daylight Time and we will commence with this closing session. So following on a tradition that was established long ago by our beloved founding director, Professor Gilbert White, and that was followed by Bill Travis, Dennis Maletti, and Kathleen Tierney. This will be the 47th year that the director of the Natural Hazard Center has issued a summary at the close of this annual workshop. What this means in practice is that to get a feel for the meeting, I split my time evenly between every session. Then on this Wednesday, I wake up when it is still night and the morning is not yet to write this closing based on the major themes that I heard from all of you throughout the preceding three days. As always, you are like rainfall on a parched landscape, making everything feel alive and renewed. Our gratitude for each participant is abundant. Thank you for making this your workshop through your presence. Before proceeding with this closing summary, I also wanna offer a special thanks to the people who helped to make this meeting possible. To begin, can you please join me in thanking the magnificent 11 student volunteers who gave so much in each session, always showing up and supporting others. To our 11 student volunteers, you have our thanks and respect, and thank you for keeping us moving forward on time throughout this week. Melissa and Jocelyn, you yet again served as the volunteer coordinators, and we send all gratitude to you for selecting and leading this team of volunteers with your usual attention to detail, thoughtfulness, and thoroughness. To participants out there, if you had a, have a word of appreciation for the volunteers, will you please share that in the chat right now? Thank you. For the past 11 months, under the most capable and extraordinary leadership of Dr. Jennifer Tobin, the Natural Hazard Center team has been planning and weaving together this workshop. Jennifer has worked alongside our core team of Jolie Breeden, Jeffrey Gunderson, Katie Murphy, Robin Albright, Jason Van Horn, and Megan Morty to make this experience all that it has been. We owe a special thanks and a debt of gratitude to them, as well as to the entire team here at the Natural Hazard Center who are shown on your screens. They have all stepped up and stepped in in the months, weeks, and days leading up to this workshop to get things done. I am reminded each and every day what a gift it is to work with these people, and it is one that I never take for granted. If you are so moved, will you now take to the chat to add a word or a note of gratitude to the members of the Natural Hazard Center team for their tireless effort and care that they have put into organizing this year's workshop? Throughout this year's workshop, 
we were yet again joined by the endlessly talented Elise Bernbach, who has taken your words and turned them into graphic recordings. You can access these through the center's website as well as through our social media. And for another round of gratitude, let's please thank Elise for putting her talents to work for all of us. Thank you so much, Elise. And please know everyone who responded to this year's prompt that Elise is generating this year's community mural that is based on your words, your wisdom, your knowledge, and your actions. And we will be sharing that soon. So please stay tuned. Natural Hazards Workshop 2022, Changing Climates. Where do we begin when it sometimes feels like the whole world could end? Climate change, yes. And also co-occurring and compounding disasters, including an ongoing global pandemic that has led to more than a million lives lost here in the US alone, and many millions more left bereaved and suffering too often in silence and the shadows. Climate change, yes. And also outrageous and morally reprehensible levels of economic inequality where a handful of billionaires hold more wealth than nearly 5 billion people around the planet. Climate change, yes. And also mass shootings and unprovoked military interventions and mass incarceration of the poor and people of color. Climate change, yes. And also assaults on our core institutions, science, democracy, and truth itself. Where do we begin when the wicked problems we face are so complex, so all-encompassing, and so deeply interwoven? We come together as we have every July for 47 years to recommit to our shared purpose to reduce the harm and suffering from disasters and to remember just how powerful we are as a people. Before his keynote address on Monday morning, Professor Bullard, a veteran of both the Marines and the civil rights movement said, that quote, in the 1960s, we were fearless because we didn't have power in institutions and we were fighting to change that. He paused and then he said, what's different now is that today's young people are fearless because the problems they face are so urgent and they recognize just how much power they do have. What do we mean when we talk about power? On Monday, during one of the concurrent sessions, Ben Hirsch of West Street Recovery, said that often when we talk about capacity in the hazards and disaster field, who has it and who doesn't, what we're actually talking about is power, who has it and who doesn't. Nearly 60 years ago, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. wrote that power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. Let me say those words again, power properly understood is nothing but the ability to achieve purpose. Dr. King went on to write that while some people have, quote, problems with power, there is nothing wrong with power if it is used correctly. When working from this definition, it is clear that power is not inherently good or bad. But as A.R. Siders of the University of Delaware reminded us yesterday, power when concentrated in the hands of a powerful few is often used to keep the status quo and to champion incremental change. Yet, she continued, what we need is radical transformational change in the face of a warming world that is also increasingly on fire or underwater. How do we get from here to there, to move from the status quo to the just and equitable futures that we envision? How, as Honorable Director Shalonda Baker of the Department of Energy called to us, do we ensure that we do right by the communities on which this country was built? If we want to do right, we need to build power. What lessons did we learn this week from this community about how to build power? First, and this is going to seem antithetical given the pressing nature of the problems that we face, but we need to slow down. 
As Simona Perry of Case Consulting said yesterday during the community forum on engaged communication, we need to set what we know aside, slow down, and be intentionally humble. Even when it is hard to be humble, when we are afraid or nervous, when you disagree, that's exactly when you have to be humble. Second, we need to listen and then to follow through. Angela Gladwell of the Federal Emergency Management Agency underscored that they are transforming their mitigation programs through listening first. And Julie Maldonado of the Livelihoods Exchange Network picked up on this theme and reminded us that we need to do that listening work. And it is work through a lens of love and compassion because everyone has a story to tell. To put an exclamation point on this, Angela Chalk of Healthy Community Services in New Orleans emphasized, if you live in a community, you are part of that community. Don't be a spectator. Get out there and listen and learn about what is going on, but also make sure you keep your commitments. Third, in order to have power, you must build trust. Trust, as several of you have noted, is not an endpoint. It is an ongoing process. And as doctoral student and Bill Anderson Fund Fellow Carlo Chunga Pizarra emphasized this morning, trust cannot be built quickly, especially with immigrant communities or other groups who often find themselves pushed to the margins and struggling to respond to an overwhelming array of hazards and disasters. We heard over and over again this week that we build trust best when we stay engaged for the long term. Kristen Marcel of the Climate Migration Network called on people who currently have power to consider the following. What if you got to know community members well? What if you co-created your approach from the very beginning? She continued. When you focus on building the trusting relationship first and understanding the story and history and context, then you can better understand the problem and what you might actually do about it. Fourth, there were forceful calls during this year's workshop to demand accountability from the private sector, non-governmental organizations, and our government agencies. This accountability can only emerge from inclusive data rigorous scientific analysis, and tireless advocacy. We are at a pivotal moment right now where the small window that we have to act on climate change and the radical inequities that we face is rapidly closing. As Bill Selecki of Hunter College observed, this moment is historic too because social science concerns and equity and justice have moved front and center in terms of climate action and hazards mitigation. As he noted, this is not just a moral position. There is now clear, assessed scientific evidence that adaptation actions are most effective when the process is inclusive, transparent, and co-generative. Fifth, and perhaps most importantly of all, if we want to build power, we must broaden our coalitions, work together across boundaries, and ensure that what we are doing leads to systemic change. This is something that this community knows how to do, but we have to go bigger, bolder, and broader than we have ever before because the challenges we face demand it. Casey Zuzak of the Federal Emergency Management Agency shared yesterday that in his 11 years of government service, he has seen more connections and coalitions being formed across government agencies around equity and climate change than ever before. Similarly, we heard from researchers throughout this meeting about how we are broadening our disciplinary connections as well as our community-based collaborations in new and innovative ways that are leading to tangible differences in people's lives. But there are still gaps and we have to constantly ask ourselves as Christina Peterson of the Lowlander Center underscored, who is not in the room? When we ask that question, we can start identifying where there is more opportunity to build literal as well as figurative bridges to get people to where they need to be. To quote Shafali Lakina, through building these elaborate networks of care, we have an opportunity to advance the systemic change that we so clearly need to respond to the crises that we face. As Betty Lai of Boston College said yesterday, 
We cannot leave it on the individual to undo unjust systems and to advance equity. Telling a person to just work harder does not work. An individual cannot undo systems of oppression. That is why we need one another to build our collective power more than ever right now. As you go forth with the vital work that you do, please remember to take care of yourself and others. With that, I declare your 47th Annual Natural Hazards Research and Applications Workshop adjourned. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Those are your words and your wisdom. We are so grateful for you and have a great week. And if you're joining us for the researchers meeting or practitioners meeting, we will look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do.